Welcome to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to sharing the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear and other random stuff. This is the second video about my Iowa TP719 tape recorder in a briefcase. If you didn't watch the first part, I invite you to watch it now. In the last video, I determined that the TP719 was not recording, and that was largely because very little signal was making it to the tape head. Test, test, test. After further testing, I found that the electrolytic capacitors were faulty. According to my tester, they weren't bad. They were really bad. I also noticed that some of the drive belts had become loose and weren't driving, they were slipping. It was surprisingly difficult to obtain the belts, but I finally got them. And that brings us to where we are now. Two belts need to be replaced. This one over here, which is not in good shape. I've got a spare here. And the other one that needs to be replaced is this one. It's very, very loose and it's barely gripping at all. I think to do that, I'm going to have to remove this plastic piece, which is held in with screws from below. So I'm going to look into that now. A total of seven screws hold that on. One, two, three, four, and five, six, and barely visible in the field, seven. As it looks, this belt here only drives the tape counter. If I would known that was all it did, then I probably wouldn't have ordered a new one because it's not especially important. But that was easy. I took out one screw from there, then this whole thing could swing around, and then it was easy to wrap the belt around the pulleys. Too easy, in fact. Probably shouldn't say that. Even though I hadn't planned on taking the plastic bezel off, it's actually a good thing because I can pull off a lot of the crud and dust and re-lubricate what needs lubricating. The old lubricant attracts dust and hair and disintegrated foam, and it doesn't do much lubricating anymore. Now to get the main flywheel belt, I'm going to take out the three screws that hold it in, and I should be able to, to lift the old belt off and put the new belt on. Sometimes things go easily, sometimes things don't. This screw here stripped, but I was able to take out these two and work out the old belt underneath this plate, and now the new one is on, and it's good and tight. It moves without slipping at all. That leaves the remaining electrolytic capacitors on the board. Quick comment about capacitor quality. Here are some almost 60 year old capacitors I removed from the Iowa machine. These devices are dead, but none, not one, has leaked. I'm going to contrast that with 40 year old capacitors I removed from a Tandy Model 100. All those capacitors were dead, and they leaked. That clearly shows that not all capacitors are manufactured to the same standards. Always buy the best capacitors you can afford. After cutting two conductors, and I mentioned that in the first video, I was able to replace nine capacitors up here. There are still eight left down there, which will be a little harder to reach. Cutting those two wires, the green and the black, allow me to turn the board over, which will allow me to replace the remaining capacitors. It's a good idea to take detailed pictures of the printed circuit board in case any of the wires should accidentally fall off. I finished recapping. This capacitor right here, uh, that was a beast to get to. There's all kinds of wires on the other side that block it. But other than that one, it wasn't too bad. Lots of capacitors though. When you reinstall, you have to make sure that this lever here will engage with the switch on the printed circuit board that engages a record instead of play. And also, at the other end, that the two transistors, those two transistors there, fit into the heat sink right there. I've reattached the wires. I add an extra two or three inches, or four or five inches, so that if I have to take it apart again, it's not going to be a strain on the wires, and I'm not going to have to cut them again. 
The only mystery is this wire right over here. It's red. First of all, it's short, so it can only go so far. And in machines like this, red is usually ground or positive. So I'm going to guess it goes here. What I'm going to do is test it and watch the current. And if there's a short, then it probably doesn't go there. A lot more volume, it's only at level 2, and it's a lot clearer. Let's try some recording. Test, test, one, two, three, hopefully you're working now. One, two, three, test. It's getting as far as the meter. I'm measuring the signal on the tape head again. One, two, three, test. Much less signal than before. What's going on? The signal is clearly getting as far as the meter, but it's not getting as far as the head, at least not all the signal. If I were to make a random guess, it would be the switch that goes between play and record. What I'm going to try is to clean that switch. Unfortunately, I don't have a schematic, because the schematic would make all the difference in the world. I would know where to put the scope to see where the signals were getting lost but I'm going to try and exercise that switch or clean that switch see what happens. Ooh. Yeah! I was very fortunate to locate a copy of the schematic online. I've since uploaded it to Radio Museum so you can get to it easily. Since these circuits are rarely straightforward, I like to highlight the different sections so I can see what's going on. I usually start with the power rails so I can trace where the power is going. This circuit gets complicated around the 12 pole double throw switch that selects between playback mode and record mode. It was necessary to map out these circuits as well. I did this by annotating the PDF using Preview on a Mac, but there are other ways to do it. What I found is summarized here and here. You'll have to pause the video if you want to see the details. Without the schematic, I didn't understand the function of the seven transistors. In fact, I thought that the transistor next to the relay was to control the relay. But in fact, that's not what it's for at all, because the relay is controlled by the presence of AC, not by a transistor. Once I had the schematic, I became very interested in the potentiometer that controls the drive to the record playhead. If it was out of adjustment, that would explain why the meter was showing a signal, but the head wasn't receiving any. Here's the answer to which pot does which adjustment. I think I found my problem. Let's go back to the schematic. Most of the record circuit is mounted on the main printed circuit board, but part is mounted on the small printed circuit board. And this is the white wire that goes between the two that wasn't well attached and came off. It's the wire that goes between the record head drive potentiometer and the record head. No wonder it wasn't working. And here's the microphone. Test, test, test. Okay, let's play back. 
first. Okay, let's play back. I think it works. As a bonus, I was given the original microphone for this machine. Now it's not perfect, it's missing a plate there, and I was told it doesn't work. So I have nothing to lose, I'm going to open it up. Unscrewing the top reveals the element, it's going to be quite fragile. And I took out the two screws on the side, nothing is separated yet. It didn't separate because there was a third screw hiding underneath what was left of the decorative plate. I've never seen this before. The microphone connects up to a transformer, which connects to the cord. Of course, that's the switch which turns on and off the motor. The switch is bad. I don't know if I have another slide switch in that size. They're not common anymore. Well, I've searched far and wide, and the closest I could find to that size is this size, which is completely wrong. So I've ordered some parts, and they'll probably come in a month or two. Here's one last look at the machine, the bottom, the side and the top. It really looks nice once it's been polished up. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to Mr. Brown's Basement for more interesting and unusual videos. And by the way, this is a recording.